Okay, I'm back on again. We'll be in Galatians this morning. I believe it's in the fourth chapter. Beginning in the fourth chapter. Oh. We're going to be talking about that God is my Father. He is my Father. We always hear the phrase a lot about our Heavenly Father. And this morning we're going to talk about why God is our Heavenly Father. Why do we call Him Father? <clears throat> Let me get this all set. Everybody stand if you wouldn't. We're going to read a few verses. And then I won't keep you up very long. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 4, verse 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, different nothing from a servant. Though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so, we, we when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son and made of him a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of a God through Christ. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for this word. Let it not return void this morning. Lift our hearts. Draw us closer to you. Let us get a new understanding of about, about our Heavenly Father, the one who guides each and everything that happens every day. Bless us here today. Bless those that could not come this day because we know there's much sickness in the land. Forgive us, Lord, of our sins, but remember those that are sin sick today and do not care to come to the house of the Lord. For it's in God's precious name we ask each and everything. Amen. Amen. <coughs> I run across a story of a, about a little girl, a little four-year-old girl, and she had gotten sick and she was... Uh, was coughing and one of those deal where she just continued to cough and they got scared there and mother got scared and decided to take her to the emergency room and while she was there she was coughing and coughing and coughing but you know how little girls are she's four years old and you know how they are they got to talk everything you know talk to the nurse about everything it, it didn't matter she just kept running her mouth running her mouth and finally the nurse was getting was trying to listen to her chest. And the little girl just kept on talking. And then finally, the nurse looks at the little girl and says, Honey, said, Shh, just shh, be real quiet. Said, I'm going to listen to see if Barney's in there. The little girl looks up there, is kind of confused, and said, Ma'am, said, I want to tell you, in my heart is Jesus. Barney's on my underwear. <laughs> Paul, the Apostle Paul tells us there's something special about having Christ in your heart. Amen? There's something special. It is something that you would never get by trying to be good or under the law itself. It gives us a position as being the sons or the heirs to God Almighty. Each and every one of us. It brings us into a place where we are full-grown sons, adopted sons of God. When we start out in our Christian life, we're all babies. Amen? We're all babies. We are to grow each and every day into maturity. However, God gives us a position when we accept Christ as our Savior and you've reached that age of accountability where you know you're a sinner and you, you leave all of that behind. All of that, all of that other behind and come into this position. God gives you a sonship, brings you. You are a full-grown son. In that very first verse, now say that the heir, as long as he's a child, 
Different nothing from a servant. The word child here is not the same child or children that was back over in chapter 3 and verse 26. Over there they're talking about child. Uh, a Greek word is hulios, meaning son. Here it's a Greek word nephios, meaning a little child, actually without the power of speech. It'd be like a little baby. Amen. That's what we're talking about. The heir, as long as he's a little child, a little one in the family, differs nothing in that day and time from the servant's children. They were just like a servant. And in fact, if you go back to Roman customs of that time, Roman homes, the servants were in charge of raising the children. The parents didn't raise them, the servants raised the children. And uh, they had charge over them, uh, just like they did their livestock or their or they kept the books for them or whatever, they were in charge of their children. And when a little one was born into the home, the servants cared for him every day. They put him in his clothes, they clothed him, they, they treated him just like their children. And this, as a baby or a child, he had to obey the servants. He had to obey what they did, just like uh, we talk about ours have to obey their parents. They had to obey the servants. It says, but under tutors and governors until the appointed time of the father. Until when? Until the appointed time of the father. In this, in this country that we live in, when are you considered an adult? Now, legally, 18. When you become 18, you're an adult. Now, when I was in school, I, I'll never forget this. I kept waiting. I wanted to get to vote but back then you had to be 21 years old to vote so i never voted until i was about 23 or 24 because my 21 for a president because when i turned 21 it was just after the election so i had to wait another two or three years to even get to vote now then they voted 18 right now then, they considered an adult at 18. And I do know this. There are some 18-year-olds that are just, are grown up as much as a 21-year-old. I know that. There really is. I also know that there are some 65-year-olds that haven't grown up yet. Amen. In this society that we live in. But it was in that day and time, in Paul's, the Apostle Paul's time, the father determined when the son was an adult. He, he determined when he would be considered an adult. An example of that would be uh, a centurion working in Caesar's army. And, and a centurion would go out and they'd do battle. And when they go into the army, they'd be gone for two, three years or three or four years. And while they're gone, and when he finally would get back, and he'd have his son, his son being raised by, his, by the servants. He'd get back home and he'd go in to, uh, to shave. And he realized that his son's been using his equipment to shave with. And you can imagine the father saying, wow, you mean he's old enough to shave? So what does he say? Well, we're going to have to have a party, basically is what they did. They called it a toga virilis. They're going to have a party and declare that he is no longer a child under the care of the servants. He is now a son. He is now a son, a full-grown son. So they would have this ceremony. They called it the Toga Virilis. And that day they would invite everybody. They would invite their uncles and grandpas and aunts and uncles and everything else to this party that they would have or ceremony. And that day... The father would put this robe on his son and declare him now an adult. He is now an adult son. Actually, you remember the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son, what did it say the father did? He ran and put a what? A robe on him. He put a toga on him. In other words, saying, this is my son. He is full grown now. He's finally... Uh, you know, the prodigal son had some problems, didn't he? He hadn't, had, he, he hadn't grown up. Uh, I guess we would say he was one of those 35-year-old uh, uh, kids. Amen? 
So he, now he had become a son. He also gave him something else. Do you remember what it was? He gave him a ring, didn't he? And what was the ring? The ring was a signet ring. And that meant that now, this is, his father gave it to him, and that's basically signing the fact that my son is now heir. He is now my son, full-blooded son. Even so, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. He says, as you were growing up, or they were growing up, they were under elements of the world. And the elements of the world is the law that was given in the Mosaic law. And they were to follow rules and regulations. But he says, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made a woman, made under the law. Do you ever think about why did God choose the time that he chose for Jesus to come into the world? Think about that. Just think with that, all of this knowledge explosion that we have now, the, the possibility of, of getting this communication all over the world in just a few seconds, why did he choose that one time for his son to come into the world? Did you ever think about that? It's, 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 it's study on that sometimes. Think about that. There was a reason, okay? We won't we've got time to go into it right now. At that time, determined by God, God the Father sent forth God the Son, born of a woman, born under the law, because Mary was what? She was a Jewish woman, right? What was the purpose in sending forth his son? Why did he send his son? In verse 5 it tells us, to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of the Son. So it was twofold purpose. Number one, it was to redeem those under the law. In other words, those who could not keep the law needed redemption, didn't they? They couldn't keep that law. You and I can't keep the law. You and I cannot live a perfect life. We, each and every one of us are sinners. And we could not live that perfect life. So he came, first of all, to redeem those that are under the law. You see, the law never could make anyone a son. <coughs> and then the third, the second part, that they might receive the adoption of sons. Now, when we think of adoption today, what happens in America when you adopt someone? Uh, most of the time you go out and you try to put, uh, you have a couple that doesn't have children, <coughs> not always, but doesn't have children, they go to a, an orphanage and they find a little baby and, and they fall in love with it and they, they want to they wanna raise this child and, and give it their name and they go through all this legal process and, and all of this stuff and, and then they get to adopt this child and raise it. However, in the Roman custom, in Paul's day, <clears throat> the parents would actually adopt their own children. They had to adopt their own son. And that's what happens when they basically took the care from, from the servants and it was going to be in their care from now on. That's why they had the, the toga barilla ceremony. Adoption, or the Greek word for thesis, means to place as a son. A believer is placed in the family of God as a full-grown son now. When he comes into the family, he is now full-grown. He's a full-grown part of the family. Other than that, he was still in the servant's care. In 1 Corinthians 2.9, but as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. This simply means this. The truth in the Word of God can be interpreted only by the Spirit of God. Until you, until the Holy Spirit gives you 
the interpretation of what this word means, you can't understand it. I, I never even had any kind of insight into the word of God. When I was growing up, I read the Bible. I read it. It was interesting. But I had no insight. The Holy Spirit was not dealing with me. The Holy Spirit did not open my eyes to the meaning of that I found in God's word. <clears throat> Whole, the Holy Spirit can alone is the one who can interpret God's word for you. And that really makes a difference to a lot of people today. <clears throat> you can bring a man, you can, you can take the most brilliant scientist in the world and let him read this book. <clears throat> and he will get nothing out of it unless the Holy Spirit Opens his heart and his eyes. <clears throat> yes. He, a man can learn all about history. You can learn everything about history from the time of Adam and Eve all the way through. You can learn it all. But you still will not understand God's word unless the Holy Spirit interprets it for you. You may know archaeology. You may know every language, spoken language there is. But it still does not matter unless the Holy Spirit is in the Word. You can become an expert in Hebrew and Greek, but it still will not give you what God intended in His Word unless the Holy Spirit is dealing with your heart. Isaiah the prophet said, for since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, who he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. If you want to know about Christ, only the Spirit of God can reveal him to you. Even a mature Christian, somebody who's been in church for all their lives, have been saved at a young age, when you open this word, you're still dependent upon the Holy Spirit to touch your heart. Why do you think it is if you can re you read a, 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 a passage of scripture today and, and, and he shows you what it means right now, what it applies to you, how, how you can, can use it in your life, everyday life, and then pick it up a year later, read the same scripture, and it'd be something entirely different that the Holy Spirit shows to you how now it applies to what you're doing? How? How can you do it? It has to be the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart. You didn't get it from, from man's wisdom. You got it from God. God speaks to you. Excuse me. If you're a new believer, if you've not been saved very long, you know something? The same Holy Spirit that shows you the, God's Word is the same one that deals with me. And I've been reading it for years and years and years. It's the same one. And He will say, show you just like He does me. You know why? Because he brought you into it. Now you are a full grown son of the living God. Oh man. And he is a prize to show you these things now. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts crying, Abba, Father. And because why? You are sons. How many of us here that have children? Or had children. We want to. We want to show, and we want to give them the best we can, don't we? Do we want? We don't want to. We don't want to restrict our child. We want to give them the best that we possibly can. Now I know there's there's lots of things about growing up, and children have to learn some stuff on their own. They really do. I agree with that. But I'm telling you, it, it, when my son was growing up, I tried to give him the best that I could. I didn't say I tried to give him everything. That's where people are going wrong today, I think. 
We try to give our children everything. They need some growing. They need this toga virilis. They need to grow up. Amen? They have to do some growing on their own. But when they are grown, or when they are grown, we want to what? Give them the best. Give them the best that we can. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of the Son into your hearts, crying out of Father. Romans 8, 16 says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are children, the sons of God. Paul continues on in Romans and says, But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead also quicken your mortal bodies by the Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live as sons. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. If you're a child of God, this, of God this morning, you will be led by the Spirit. You shall be led by the Spirit. <clears throat> Can I tell you this? It is a great life to be a Christian. You realize that? It is good life to be a Christian. It, it is good. It, it makes you feel good. I don't know about you. It does me. First of all, it makes me good, feel good that I know that I'm saved, that I'm on my way to heaven one day. But I love living for the Lord each and every day. Now, in life, people struggle with things, all kinds of things. Particularly addictions. You know, do you know someone that's been in, addicted, let's say, to alcohol? And they somehow come through it or got through it but didn't go to church. Do you know people? There are people that do that, that actually do. They go to AA or whatever it is. But you know something? Even though if they conquered that, they're never truly happy. Why? Because they do not have the Spirit of God in them. Give up smoking. I gave up smoking. But I was never as happy as I was giving up smoking it until I knew the Lord. Amen. He puts a spirit of, of happiness that, well, you just can't describe it. There's no way to describe it. You can, you can conquer things in this life, in your flesh, but it's never going to make you happy or fulfill you if you do not have the spirit, <clears throat> that dwell in dwelling spirit living in you, you'll never be as happy as you would be. God will see you through these things if you will let him. If you'll let him do it. <clears throat> you'll never be as satisfied <coughs> until you Receive the Holy Spirit in your heart. You don't need to say, my, I, I, I'm just not been living right lately. I wonder if, I wonder if, if I really am a child of God. How many of you have ever had a child that misbehaved? Huh? Did your, did your children ever misbehave? Were they still your child? Yes, they were, weren't they? It's the same thing with God. When he looks down at us, you know something? Don't you know he just sometimes shakes his head? He said, I can't believe he did that. How many of you have ever said that? About your child? I just can't believe he did that. I, I, I just can't believe him. Believe it. 
You have received the spirit of adoption whereby Christ have a father. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit. When they were translating the King James Version of the Bible, they would not translate the, or they would not translate the word Abba. You know why? Because they said it it's too informal. They're saying that it's saying daddy. And uh, they were saying that God is a wonderful heavenly father and it, they would just hesitate to say daddy. I can understand. I had, uh, growing up, I had a friend in, in school and he called his dad Pop. And I... To me, that was the most disrespectful thing you could have ever done. I would have never called my father Pop. I didn't call him father. I called him dad, okay? But how many's ever heard the old man upstairs or the big man upstairs or, or the, the good guy or whatever? They have some slang name for him. Truly, he is our heavenly father. He's our father. We should treat him with that respect. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then the heir of God through Christ. The Spirit, therefore, gives us the experience of being a son. And I don't know about you, I've got a son. The only one we got. And I'll stand right here in front of all of you and tell you I'm very proud of my son. How many of us are living our lives so that our Heavenly Father can look down and say, I'm proud of my son. I'm proud of him. You know something? If you're living within the Lord, if you're living for the Lord this day, and you have the Holy Spirit indwelled in your heart, you're going to try to live in such a way that you will honor your Heavenly Father. There's many who believe that the only way that you can, how would you say, please the Father is to walk around like this. Well, your nose is up in the air. You know, you can't do that. There's some churches teach that you've got to be on a higher plane of sanctification. In other words, you've got to be more sanctified than everybody else. You can't get down and live with the sinners. You try to walk not with the sinners. You only try to walk so what do you walk? You walk with yourself. Amen? There's some churches that teach that you have to be baptized with this Holy Spirit or you can never ever reach that plane. You can never be have that full sonship unless you're baptized by the Holy Spirit. They insist that you've got to get on a higher level. You've got to live different. You've got to be up here. Or you can never be sanctified. Let me assure you this. If you're a believer, a new believer, a weak believer, you can still experience the same sonship. You are also adopted into the family of God. When people reach a high level of spirituality, you know what they do? They think they're better than everybody else. We're always, and, and get this, if you get nothing else out of this sermon, out of all this yakking that I've done up here this morning, we're still just God's foolish little children. Amen? And we go out and we do foolish things every day. We're always filled with ignorance and stubbornness we got sins, we're fear, we're weakness. There's, we are never, ever wonderful. Only Jesus is wonderful. The Lord Jesus is wonderful. And faith in him will give you a wonderful life.
One old preacher said this. When you get saved, you need to take that old life that you had and you need to treat it like an old dead cat. Just grab it up by the tail and just throw it away. And you can do that. You know what happened? The old cat's got nine lives. He just keeps coming back, don't he? Huh? Actually, I think he probably got more than nine lives. He probably got 20, 30 lives. Amen? He just keeps coming back. So we have to kill the old cat again, don't we? We will never become perfect saints. And because your sons of God have sent forth the Spirit of the Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son. If a son, then an heir of God through Christ. You know, if you have that Holy Spirit living within you, Sometimes life can just get, you know what sometimes life is? Sometimes life's just boring, isn't it? Isn't it? Huh? When it, when it just the same old thing over and over again, and you think about it, it's kind of boring. But I know this, when you come up on a real problem, as I said when I was going into my heart surgery, I had a real problem. It was a real problem in my life. You know, I've been to the hospital with, I know Dora's been in the hospital before, and I've been to the hospital several times visiting people, seeing people, but now when they told me I'm going to have to have heart surgery, hey, they're not going to let me go home. Everybody else is going to go home. I'm going to have to stay here. And I'm a scaredy cat. You don't know the truth. But I had to pray. Dora and I had to pray about that, and we prayed hard. And you know something? It was no longer time to be, how would you say, joking around. It was time to get serious with God. That's when, you, when that doctor says, we're going to have to open your chest up and work on your heart. That's when God becomes a reality. Amen. No more. No more of that man way off over there. That big man up in the sky. This is God. I want, I want to talk to God right now. Right here. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we're children of the Son of God. God makes himself real during times of distress. When, it, when, when you're going through something that you just you just can't see the end of it yourself. God will make it real. I've got to hurry here. He says, in my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge, notwithstanding the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. This is uh, in 2 Timothy 4, 16. The Lord stood with Paul when he was going through things. And you know something? He'll stand with you too. Whatever you're going through. He stood with me during that surgery. I know that. And he'll stand with you. And in fact, Hebrews 13, 5 says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Everybody stand. You and Ruby want to get a song of invitation?